Well, let me welcome you into week number four. We are almost halfway through our nine-week teaching series where together, as most of you know, we are thinking about this idea of being transformed. Uh, On Easter Sunday, we began thinking about, learning about, and celebrating the power of the risen Christ to bring change, transformation to our lives. And we talked about what that means. What does it mean to be transformed? It's not a tweaking of who we are. It's not a small adjustment in our character. It is a radical, a dramatic, and a thorough transformation by God of who we are. And if you were here a few weeks ago, you'll remember that I shared with you out of 2 Corinthians 5 the biblical basis for Christian transformation. It's part of our text today, but before we read the whole text, let me just uh, take you to verse 17 to remind you of the biblical basis for this idea of being transformed. So verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man or woman, any person be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation... Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. So this is a work of creation. The moment of salvation, when we come to faith in Jesus, is much more than I've been forgiven of my sins and I'm going to heaven. It's far more than that. When we come to faith in Jesus, it is the beginning of a lifelong radical transformation of who we are of what it is that we truly are in our core. And over the weeks, we've seen some examples of this kind of transformation. We've learned some examples from the Scripture. We talked about the transformation of Peter, how that Jesus met Peter there by the shore of Galilee, and he took him from being a man in deep despair who had walked away from his role as a disciple and had gone back to fishing, and Jesus restored him to faithfulness and usefulness. By the way, he can do that for you as well. If you feel defeated and knocked down and like somewhere you've messed up and you feel like you're used goods and God can't use you anymore, let me welcome you into the transformation of Peter that God can, in fact, restore us to joy and purpose and usefulness. We saw him do this for Mary Magdalene, whom he transformed from being a demon-possessed woman to being a devoted disciple, Mary Magdalene. Then we saw the transformation of Saul of Tarsus, who went from being a persecutor of the church to becoming Paul the Apostle, who was the great preacher of the gospel in the first uh, century and who carried the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. So three examples. And those three examples, Peter, uh, Saul, and Mary, those would be enough illustration to remind us and to assure us that God can change our lives. But we've heard some relevant, personal, and very local stories as well. We heard from Chris McDonald, a part of our church. We heard from Marie Parker, a part of our church. We heard from Jack Kitching, who came to faith here just a few months ago, and his uh, life is being transformed. And so we've seen some very up close and personal transformation stories as well. We're going to continue to do that as we continue on in the coming weeks. We're going to continue to hear stories. So, so far in this Transform series, we've talked about why, or who it is that Christ transformed, and we've talked about what it is that he does for us. In the coming weeks, we're going to talk about the how, how it is. What are the elements of transformation that he uses? And ultimately and finally, in week number nine, we'll talk about the hope of our transformation, that future eternal and complete transformation that happens when we see Jesus when we arrive in heaven. Today, however, I want to talk about Not the what or the who or the how, but today I want to talk about the why. Why? In fact, let me ask you this question. Why do you think God is so committed to your transformation? By the way, he is. He is completely, thoroughly, relentlessly devoted to changing you and changing me. Why do you think that's the case? Why does God want to work such a dramatic and thorough change within us? Well, the answer to the question is really quite simple. And it is that our lives were created and redeemed for a very specific purpose. And without change, that purpose 
is impossible. If I do not change, what God wants me to do is impossible. I would say it to you this way. My old man or the old me. Everybody say that. The old me. Say it. The old me. Listen carefully. The old me is incapable of doing what God wants the new me to do. And so if I am going to do what God wants me to do, if I'm going to live out God's ordained purpose for my life, I must change, and he is committed to bringing about that change in my life. Now, by the way, I should stop and tell you that the world has this concept completely upside down, don't they? They really do. Because what the world says is that you should always and only be who you are. You should never try to change, and anyone who truly loves you will accept you just as you are, and they will never call you to change. The world says if you don't love me and accept me just like I am, then you don't really love me. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, that is absolutely terrible theology, and it is not true in any kind of practical way at all. In fact, I would suggest to you the opposite is different. Not only is it not true that love doesn't call for change, love compels us to change. Do you know how much I've had to change in the last 36 years because I love Tracy and she loves me? I have to tell you, I'm not the same man that she married. I'm not even close to being the same man that she married. I have had to change because I love her and because she loves me. Now, admittedly, not to the same degree, but she's had to change a little bit too. Thank you very much. No, we, we do. We, we have to change. Someone said, God loves me just the way I am. You know, Billy Graham made this idea famous by closing every crusade with the invitation hymn. We used to sing this a lot in our churches as the invitation hymn as well. Do you know what it is? It is, just as I am, I come. God loves me just like I am, and I'm going to come to him just like I am. So somebody said, God loves me just like I am. Well, that's true. He does. And for every person that says God loves me just the way I am, here's the Bible answer. Yes, he does. And he loves you far too much to leave you like you are. Amen? He loves us, but he's absolutely committed to changing us, to transforming us. And so we need to understand this love that God has for us, this transformation that he has designed for us, and the purpose that it then fulfills. And so let's read. I'm, I'm going to begin in verse 17 again. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse Number 17, we'll read down through verse 20. So the Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, or all of this is of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of of reconciliation. I want you to stop right there for one second. We'll keep reading in a second. But I want you to take your pen and in the margin of verse number 18, I want you to write the word his. His. Because what verse number 18 is saying, he has given to us his ministry of reconciliation. It's not just the ministry of reconciliation. It's certainly not my ministry of reconciliation. It's his ministry of reconciliation that he has entrusted to us. We'll come back to that in a minute and you'll see why that's important. Well, verse number 19 says, that is, or to wit, the King James says, that is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, as a result of this, we are the ambassadors for Christ. 
as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, we urge you in Christ's stead or on the behalf of Christ, we urge you to be reconciled unto God. Now, if you're a note taker, I want you, and I hope you are a note taker, by the way, I want you to write down, let's just begin by considering God's purpose for every Christian life. So I said to you that God has a purpose for our lives. That's why he's committed to changing us. We need to fulfill that purpose. So what is God's purpose for every Christian life? You'll notice the Bible says that every, verse number 17, every person who's in Christ, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. So in the same way that God created the earth and the universe and all that is, he's the creator of all things, when we come to faith in Christ, that salvation moment, that transformation, that conversion is a creative work as well. And in the same way that he created the universe for a purpose, he creates or recreates our lives for a purpose as well. Verse number 18 tells us that this work of recreation is the work of God, or all of this is the, is the doing, the working of God. So we're reconciled by faith in Christ from an old place, an old life, an old creation. We come to faith in Jesus. He begins the work of recreating us for this new purpose, out of an old and a dead place into a new and a living place place where our life is in an abundant relationship with Jesus. All of that to a new end or a new purpose. Now listen to those words. All things are being worked by God, created by God for a new purpose. Does that language sound familiar to you at all? Is there a is there another passage that might come to mind that sounds very familiar with these words? All things God is working for a new purpose. Well, if you don't know what it is, let me tell you. It's Romans 8, 28 that so many of you know. In fact, why don't you turn there? It's only a few pages forward. Right in front of Corinthians, you'll find Romans. Go to Romans 8 and look at verses 28 and 29. You'll hear the similarities. Verse number 28 says, and we know. Everybody say, we know. We know. We don't, we don't think so. We don't hope so. We're not hanging on to hope that maybe this will happen. We know. We're assured. We're certain that all things. How many things? Yeah, all things. We know that everything or all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now I want you to take your pen and circle in verse number 28, the last word in the verse. It's the word purpose. Purpose. And the Greek word that's translated purpose is a combination of two words. It's pro and thesis, prothesis. And the, so the idea of a thesis is an, an idea or a, a plan, and pro is that direction in which it's going. So when the Bible says that God has a purpose for our lives, it is a plan with direction. He's not meandering about it. He is intentionally following a map working his intentional objective to uh, complete this purpose or this plan in our lives. And it shouldn't surprise you that God has a plan for your life. In fact, God has a plan for every Christian's life and he has the same plan for every Christian's life. What is it? Verse 29 tells you his purpose for every Christian life is that we would be conformed to the image of his son. Verse 29 says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to what? He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Now the word conformed in verse 29 means to be shaped like or to be cut out according to the pattern to or pressed into the mold of. It's to share, it's to share in, to be conformed 
to something or to become similar in form. What are we to be similar to? Verse number 29 says, we are to be similar to or conformed to the image of his son. The Greek word for image is icon, and it means to be a a reflection of or the mirror image of. How many of you looked in the mirror this morning? Raise your hand if you did. Do you know what you saw? Like it, lump it, bump it, or jump it. What you saw is what you are. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this, but this morning I got dressed. Trace and I were getting ready. I looked in the mirror, and this is exactly what I said. Well, this makes me look short and round. (laughs) And then I said out loud, well, actually, it doesn't make me look short and round. I am short and round because the mirror does not lie. Here's what the Bible says, that it is God's purpose for your life, that you would be changed transformed, shaped into a life, a form that looks like, that resembles what Christ or who Christ is. That's his purpose for you. He's relentlessly committed to achieving this purpose of making my life and yours to resemble the life of Christ. And to this end, he has been working for that purpose. In fact, look at verse number 29. It says, for those whom he did foreknow. Those whom he did foreknow. Now, I need to tell you that the idea of foreknowledge in this verse, in in the scripture, is not simply that God is intuitive or even that God is omniscient and he knows all things, he sees the future, he knows what we'll do, and therefore he has this foreknowledge. That's not what the word means. The the idea of foreknowledge is an intimate relationship with, that he's having a relationship with us. So when the Bible says that those whom he foreknew, it means that he was planning a relationship with us before we even knew that he existed. In fact, Scripture tells us uh, in, in Romans and Galatians and other passages that he has been planning this relationship since the time before he made the earth. He foreknew us, he planned this relationship, and then he predetermined the outcome of the relationship. What was that? He predestined, verse 29 says. What? He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. So he knew us before he made worlds. He planned a relationship with us before he created the worlds. And then he predetermined that the relationship with which that we would have with him would lead us ultimately to becoming the reflection of his son, Jesus. If you are tracking with me, I want you to shout amen. All right? That we would become to be like him. And he has been working this since before he made the worlds and specifically since he called us. Verse number 29 says he called us into that purpose. He knew us. He planned it. He called us. Now you think about this. When you came to faith in Jesus, do you remember when it was? Maybe you were a kid. Maybe it was just last week. Nine people last week came to faith. When you came to faith in Jesus, it was more than God saying to you, hey, I love you, I want to forgive you and take you to heaven. It was more than that. It was God saying, hey, I love you, I want to forgive you, I want to take you to heaven. But along the way, I'm going to radically, thoroughly, and dramatically change who you are so that your life will no longer look like your old life. It will look like the life of my son. That's his determined outcome for your life. And he is now, verse number 28 says, working all things to accomplish that. We know that all things work together. The word that's translated working, synergeo, we get our word synergy. It means that God is taking everything in our lives and he's working them together to uh, complete this work of transforming us into the likeness of Jesus. It means the good things in your life, God is using those to make you more like Jesus. And it means the bad things in your life, God is using those to make you more like Jesus. It means the good news that makes you rejoice, man, God's using that. And the bad news that causes you to weep, he's even using that. And that when you get it right and you grow as a disciple and you do as you should, God is using that. But when you mess up 
and you fail and you stumble, that he is so big and so good and so gracious that he can even take those things and redeem them and use them. Because everything in our lives he is using to create this life that he has predetermined would be true of us. That our lives would be like his. Now what is our response to that? If these things be so, my beloved... How should we respond? Well, he tells us in verse number 28, the right response is that we love him for such grace. He says in verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And who are those that love him? Those that he has called. And so we should respond to his grace and his plan and his change. Do you know what I've discovered over the years in pastoral ministry? People don't like change very much. It's true. It doesn't really matter what it is. We're just, we're a little suspicious of change. We're a little resistant to change. We, we don't like change a whole lot. And I'm with you. I don't always like change either. But can I tell you something? You should be so in favor of God changing who you are. Because what he has designed would be 10,000 times better than taking a two, no, a 1983 Gremlin and turning it into a 2021 Tesla. Because what he has planned for you is so much better than what we've been in the past. Amen? And we ought to go, Lord, I'm, I'm so grateful you're doing that and I love you for it. Well, he's changing us. He's committed and this is his purpose for my life and yours. But is that the end game? Is, is this, uh, this, this concept of him changing me to be more like Jesus, is that what it's all about? Is that the end game? Well, it really is. I mean, in eternity, yes, it's absolutely what it's all about to the glory of God. But it's not only all about that. Because along the way, in this life, the transformation that he's working in us serves to equip us for our own purpose in living while we're here. Write this down. Let's think about our purpose for living. God has a purpose for all of us, but then what are we living for in this life? Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and we'll see it. As God is working this purpose of conformity into the likeness of Christ, he's doing it so that we can fulfill our great purpose for living. And, and what is that? Well, verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passing away. The new has come. God is changing us. Verse 18, All of this work of transformation is from God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, before we talk about what our purpose is for living, let me just say to you that our purpose is rooted in the great purpose of Christ and his life when he was here on the earth. And what was his great work? Verse number 18 it says that God was in Christ, I'm sorry, verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sins unto them. Well, by the way, every sinner in the room ought to say praise God, amen? Praise God that Christ came to work out reconciliation between sinners and God so that God would not hold sinners accountable for their sins, but he would forgive their sins through the work of Christ. Hallelujah! That's the gospel, Praise God for that. But this work of Christ is the foundation of, it's the root, it's the, the, the basis of our own purpose in this earth. Now, that work of, of reconciliation that Christ initiated, is it over? When Christ came and he died and he rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven. Did the work of reconciliation end when Christ left the earth? Well, it didn't, and you ought to be glad that it didn't because you and I weren't here when Christ was here. But it continues on to us. So the work has continued. Well, who is it that's now to live out this purpose of reconciling men and women to, uh, to God? It's us because Christ is in heaven. So our great purpose as the body of Christ is to carry out this work of reconciliation. In fact, he says in verse number 18, all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and, verse 18, has given to us, and I asked you to change the word from the to his, 
who has given us his ministry of reconciliation. So it's his ministry of reconciliation started by Christ 2,000 years ago, continuing on today. It's his work. Now we just are the ones who have been called responsible for carrying it out. In other words, he's passed the baton to us. So in the same way that Christ came to reconcile sinners, we exist today to reconcile, to see sinners reconciled to God. He goes on to say in verse number 19 that he has implanted in us, he has given to us the word, do you see it verse 19? Committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's the gospel. Now, by the way, can I just be perfectly clear? There's only one message of reconciliation. That's it, one There's one way that sinners are reconciled to God. There aren't two, there aren't one and a half, and there certainly aren't hundreds. There is one way that people get reconciled to God. It is through the word of reconciliation, which is the proclamation of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Nothing else. And you know who has that message? The ones to whom he has committed it. And that is us. He says that it is his work of reconciliation. It is his message of reconciliation, which is the gospel. And verse number 20 says, he has given that to us and he has then appointed us as representatives. This is your life work. We are the ambassadors for Christ. It is your life work to bring about the reconciliation of sinners to God. Now, we tend to think that our life work is you know, I'm a, I'm a butcher, baker, candlestick maker. I, I do whatever it is that I do. My career is my life work. And along the way of doing my life's work, I might see some people come to faith in Jesus. That's backwards. That's upside down. What the Bible says is that you have this life purpose. It is to carry out Christ's work of reconciliation in the world as you are butcher, baker, candlestick maker, as you are going about your career, your life, your family, your hobbies, whatever it is that you do. That along the way we do those things, but our real purpose is to bring people to faith in Jesus. And that's why he is committed to transforming us into the likeness of Jesus. So that as we're being changed, truly transformed to resemble the likeness of Christ, then we go through this world, transform people more like Jesus than we could have ever been without him, than we would would have ever been without him, carrying out this ministry and urging people to come to faith in Christ. I don't know how that makes you feel. Because for some of you, you will say, I get that. Amen. That's what I'm about. Man, my heart. I mean, I, yeah, I go to work tomorrow morning and I'm busy and I got life going on. There's all these pressures and things. But I get it, man. I know every day that I draw breath, it's about bringing people to faith. That's why I live. It's what I pray for. It's what I share about. It's what I, what, what I invest in. It's what my life is about. Some of you get it. Others of you don't. And you've come to faith in Christ. Jesus is your Savior, but it's never occurred to you. That the reason he left you here after he saved you, the reason you're drawing breath right now is because he has a ministry of reconciliation in this world and he's committed it to you to carry out. Now, loved ones, if he's been planning this, listen carefully, since the foundation of the world, if he has known you and loved you and called you and planned for you to be like his son so that being like his son, you could carry on the ministry of his son, this ministry of reconciliation in the world. If that is his predetermined, his prothesis, his purpose for your life, and it has been working since eternity passed in this direction, and now everything about your life is going in this direction, do you assume he's okay with that? Would you be? If you planned for your son or your daughter to do something and you said on this date, this is what we're going to do and this matters and this is important and you planned it and you said to them, okay, the day is here, go do it. And if they said, nah, I'm going to go play soccer instead, there's not a parent in the room that would be okay with that. And do we presume that our heavenly father who has orchestrated a life to his glory for eternity And says to us, now here it is, live it out. And we go, nah, I think I'll do something different. See you when I get to heaven. Do you presume that he says, okay, 
And that when you get to heaven, having lived that kind of indifferent life to the purpose for which he saved you, do you presume that he will look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Are you kidding me? Do you really believe that? No, you understand, he has a ministry of reconciliation in this world. And he has called us to it. Now, now you might be thinking, well, okay, I mean, I think all of you who are honest would say, well, amen, I get it. I understand, but what do I do? How do, how, do I, how, do I, how do I participate in that? Well, it's a good question. So let me close our time together by taking you to that passage in Matthew 4 where you've maybe been holding your finger all this time and it's now numb. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Just in closing, just to, to think about how we can participate with, with God in this work. In Matthew 4, you're at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, his earthly ministry. He's calling his disciples. He's beginning to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And, um, and so he starts to call his disciples. Now, I think we would agree, wouldn't we, that the disciples, while they messed up and they, they stumbled, they failed like all of us do, they did carry out the purpose that God called them to. They did carry on the ministry of reconciliation. Not perfectly, but they did do it. So they're good models for us as to how we might participate in this ministry as well. So look at verse 17. Matthew 4, 17 says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. By the way, this is where his message began. This is the first preaching, the first teachings of Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. By the way, do you know what the word repent means? Change. Transform. Be different. Right? He's committed to change. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers or fishermen. And he said unto them, verse 19, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Same thing happened in the next verse with James and John. Jesus called Peter and Andrew and James and John and others to follow him and to, to carry out this message or this ministry of reconciliation. So based on their example, what can we do? Let me just tell you quickly. Number one, follow him. Follow Jesus. Verse number 19, he says, follow me. The word means come along with me. Change your direction and follow me. Now, I love you. I'm serious. I love you with all my heart. And I love Brookstone with all of my heart. And I love America and I love the American church. But I got to tell you, in the American church, we've missed this. Because so many in the American church believe that Christianity is about God coming along with us. Jesus, you come along with me. Bless my life. Make it good, easy, blessed, and, and happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise. Jesus, come along with me and help me in life. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, you come with me. Now, there's two radically polar opposites. He said, follow me. And loved ones, you will never live out your purpose. You will never become who Christ wants you to be, living out your purpose, carrying out this ministry of reconciliation until you say, I have decided I'm going to follow Jesus. That's what my life is about. I'm going, it doesn't mean I'm going to leave my nets. It doesn't mean I'm going to quit my job and, and go to the mission field unless he calls you to that. But what it does mean that as you go about life, your life is in the footsteps of Jesus. You're following him. Number two, he says, follow me. Secondly, I will make you. I will make you. The word means I will change you. I'm going to turn you into what you're not from what you are to what you haven't been. You've been a fisher man, a fisher of fish. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I'm going to take what you're good at. I'm going to take your passions. I'm going to take your skill sets. I'm going to transform you so that using your skill sets, you can become this person that I've called you to be. I will make you. In other words, you cannot live out the purpose of a disciple until you allow him to make you into what you're not. It means you got to cooperate with the transformation. It means you got to quit resisting. you got to quit rebelling. you got to quit saying, no, I don't want to change. you got to stop. And you got to say, Jesus, change me. Make me what you want me to be. Number one, follow me. Number two, I will make you. Number three, I will make you fishers of men. It means that I'm going to change what you value because everything about these scaly 
smelly fish that Peter and Andrew and James and John spent their, their lives gathering. It put food on their table. It made them who they were. It gave them significance in the community. And he said, I'm going to ask you to value the souls of men and women. If y'all are listening, shout amen. I'm going to ask you to, to value the souls of men and women more than you value the things of this world. That's what I'm going to say. That's what Jesus says I'm going to say. That if you are going to carry out your purpose in this world of carrying on the ministry of reconciliation as a person that I've known since before I've made worlds, that I've loved, that I've planned a relationship with, that I've predetermined the outcome of your life so that it will look like me, so that looking like me you can represent me as an ambassador and you can carry out my ministry of reconciliation in the world. Here's your part. Follow me. Cooperate with my transformative work. And care more about the souls of people than you care about the things of this world. And if you'll do that, then your life will be a life that can carry out this ministry of reconciliation. And your life will make a difference. The old me cannot do what God wants the new me to do. So I must let him change me into what he wants me to be. That is why he's committed to my transforming. 